Hey everybody, P. Dave Turner, an executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. As we continue to explore epigenetics and personalized medicine, looking at individual approaches to getting better and actually staying healthier up front, we have explored the epigenetic space, peptides, and that kind of thing with Dr. Gappin and Attila Haidu. Those episodes are awesome. You should check them out. Today, we're going to look at the female aspect of it with another doctor who's new to the team, but not new to the profession. Her name is Dr. Larissa. She's out of Florida and actually going to have an episode coming up with Dr. Larissa and Dr. Gappin talking about how couples can approach precision, personalized medicine. And I just love this field because this is truly where we're going. Instead of waiting for something to break, how do you optimize what you've got now? And now, how do you take care of yourself in a modern fashion? We know this stuff now. This isn't the olden times. So this is really neat to be able to explore this topic with Dr. Larissa. I highly encourage you guys to go check out all of her stuff. If you type in Dr. Larissa with two E's, S and A, you will find her. She's out there and, and ladies especially, or tell your lady, hey, this is this is the way we're going. Let's look into this and see if we can find something that makes sense for us. Okay, uh, next thing. If you like what we do, if you like exploring all of these topics, bringing these incredible people on, here's how you support the show. One, tell a friend about it. I mean, honestly, that's the honest to God's truth best way to do it. Getting somebody else to take a try on a show like, hey, have you heard the Break It Down show? Try this episode. When we have uh, that, you know, Eric Kleinsmith and Tom Colton uncovering who D.B. Cooper is, you know, that should be your resource. You should say, hey, I know about D.B. Cooper. Did you hear the Break It Down show? Those kind of things are really powerful when you have that personal advocacy. If you like what we do, that would help us out. Finally, and you know what I'm going to say now, save the brave, save the brave.org. Your time, your attention, your shares on social media, all of these things matter. The more people understand what Save the Brave is and what we do, the better job we can do at resourcing the things that we need to do to get this help to these people who have fought, uh, fought for us and helped us protect our freedom. Here comes Dr. Larissa. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Dr. Larissa, and welcome to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Now, this is a pretty interesting thing. We've had Dr. Gappin on the past talking about epigenetics okay. and peptides and, and looking at medicine from, instead of a, hey, you're broken, let's fix you, let's medicate you, but looking at it from a more proactive and optimization-focused approach. We've also had uh, Attila Haidu, who's approaching epigenetics and cancer as a resolution for things like geoblastoma, which is just an absent scourge in the cancer world. And so we haven't explored the female side of this stuff. So I thought we'd bring on Larissa to talk to us about, you know, just how we take care of ourselves and what modern medicine looks like. And we start to peer into the future mm -hmm. and, and really get excited about just how many things we can do to improve the condition of our body before it breaks down. So it's a mm -hmm. real interesting conversation. What do you think? How did I do in that? I'm, I'm talking way out of my league, by the way. Here, mm -hmm. so uh, No, I, I think you nailed it, actually, because regardless, I truly believe that people need an understanding because if you get around too many doctors or too many people in that world, it'll be words that are like, what? What is that? So I think you you nailed it with, kind of putting those pieces together so it can be understood. I was having a conversation today with another friend, Shelly Klingerman, and we were talking about, uh, I'm currently doing a, an eating program, trying to speed my metabolism up and then try mm -hmm. to find, you know, better habits because we're always trying mm -hmm. to eat better and everything. And she was saying, that's funny. You're eating more often to speed up metabolism. And uh, the guy I'm reading about right now says to do intermittent fasting. And I said, well, all of this mm -hmm. stuff is really dependent upon your genetic makeup. I learned this from mm -hmm. Tracy and, and mm -hmm. learning like you can attune and detune your genetic proclivity by eating mm -hmm. a certain way and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. How common is this practice to, to do this kind of thing? Like in America, is this, is it 5% of the people doing it? Is it 50? What do you think? I definitely think we're on the low end because this is a more individualized approach. And I was having a conversation with um, someone in the epigenetics world recently. And oftentimes it's difficult to get people to understand that this is not um, healthcare management insurance model at present. 
Mm. Do, is it something that we see in the future? And what does that look like now that we so actively use healthcare managed system? Yes, you know, hopefully so. But it's on the low end for sure. This, uh, even when I came across it and being a conventional trained medical doctor, but yet I extended out of that world because I realized that women are, we're so different. You need other tools to really understand and really care down and what is necessary and what is needed. And so it gives that individualized approach that we're just not talking about or speaking about on a very media global wide to the um, to the common person who's in that healthcare managed world. And then the other thing is the confusion between eat less, eat more, eat green, yes. eat beef. Uh, yes. How, we, how mm-hmm. in the world do we sort all this stuff? Because these people, <laughs> a lot of times they have they have doctor in front of their name, and maybe they're a medical doctor, maybe they're some other kind mm-hmm. of doctor, and maybe they have license to do it. But these things are individual solutions. Is that not true? Yes, these are individual solutions. I think at times you can always put like a, a broad brush toward things. I mean, like the Atkins diet is still very popular. You have keto out there and so many other things where people have garnered the success that they want it, you know, reach their health goal and their outcome. There's so many things and variations in between where I, where I feel that if you get more targeted and more specific, you can get more long-term goals because a lot of people want longevity. They want anti-aging. They're seeking something more than just, oh, okay, well, you do this and majority of America is doing it or that's the fad right now. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you how do you get away? I mean, I, and I guess this is what, what you're trying to do is get away from the fads and let me try this mm-hmm. and the crash diets and... Mm-hmm. try to really build a lifestyle. Is there room? I mean, if, if you spend the money to get all the different tests, we had Wade Lightheart on and he talked about like there's five tests that are basic required to sort of figure out what you need and where you're going. Are you still able to eat? I mean, obviously you want to have some kind of control over what you have. You can't just mm-hmm. eat everything all the time, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. if you do using peptides and epigenetics, and those kind of things to, to balance things out, can you still do things like have ice cream or have cake at the party when you go or Are you really committing to something that's a lot more firm? That's an easy question. But at the same time, too, my response is one of a very authentic nature. I'm going to eat my birthday cake. Yes. (laughs) Thank God. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Yes. I thought you were going to say you had to be hard. (laughs) No, not at all. Because part of gearing to that environment of epigenetics is understanding is not only nutrition is the environment that you surround yourself in. So whether it's grief, trauma, happiness, or what have you. And if, you know, if you know that you are just starting a program and you are really looking for um, more long-term results, and I'm good about this. I'll ask people, do you have something going on? You know, like you're going on vacation, something, because I don't want you to start this now because I want you to be very focused because you're not going to really reach a lot of the health outcomes you're seeking if you're not really consistent with something for at least three months, you know, to really see that tie, to see some of those bodily changes where you may feel it, mm-hmm. um, but you will also physically see it. So please eat your birthday cake or have some, <laughs> have those opportunities where you can. And some people may disagree with that, but yeah, I want to eat my birth- birthday cake. I want to have, have an occasional cocktail and I'm a woman in my forties. And honestly, alcohol can work against us more often than not if we're more continued users. So we'll talk about that. I, I mean, every, mm-hmm. everybody says, this is my, one of my favorite mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. People say everything in moderation. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> no fooling. What's moderation? What is, I mean, obviously you're not trying to give out medical advice or anything like that, but mm-hmm. what is moderation when it comes to a cocktail or two or three mm-hmm. or whatever it is? Mm-hmm. What's your guidance? I, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible because in my head, I'm thinking about, okay, brown liquor, mm-hmm. white liquor. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about wine and what is the occasion? And moderation, technically, for any amount of alcohol will be the amount of probably carbs that are involved. I mean, there's certain drinks like a Long Island iced tea, you're talking about multiple. So yeah. moderation would be if you're really trying to lose weight and do, you, you don't need to go for a buy one, get one or mm-hmm. a happy hour situation <laughs> when, it's a, when it's a Long Island. May you get away with maybe occasional two glasses of wine? Yes, but 
there's certain calories and carbs and things that are already in alcohol and how it breaks down in your body, even more importantly, and are you able to get rid of it? And some of the things in the epigenetic profile, you can figure out, okay, are you someone who slowly metabolizes? And your moderation may be that occasional drink as opposed to I'm hitting a happy hour every week type thing, as opposed to someone that can probably get rid of it quicker and be able to detox any of those calories out before they really show up, then they may have a little bit of leeway. Can anyone legitimately drink a cocktail, glass of wine, beer a day and say they're drinking with moderation? Or is that that too much? I don't think so. Yeah. I I think that is too much, especially if you have a spit. And I see a lot of women where weight issues become a problem. And I get this all the time. I used to do this 20 years ago, or I could get away with this. And That's the thing. Your body adapts. Your body changes. It's been able to take it then. But right now you have more increased stress. You have more increased other things around you that are impacting you and you're just seeing it more for sure. So you have less leeway Mm -hmm. at times for Mm -hmm. sure. And then the other thing I've learned from from all you guys is that as we do things for 20, 30 years, as you said, the system Mm -hmm. adapts and also in some ways Mm -hmm. it kind of breaks down. Like if you feed Mm -hmm. it something other than the optimal Mm -hmm. And if you think about like anything Mm -hmm. that runs at lower than a hundred percent, you're making the liver run on Mm -hmm. less good material for it to process. Your brain Mm -hmm. then gets a lower grade of blood. And Mm -hmm. these things have, Mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, I am not the doctor, but that has a degenerative Mm -hmm. effect on, on, and it only multiplies as you get older. It does. And when I, and when I state something about adaptation, it doesn't mean that it, your body creates a maladaptive environment uh, because your body's been so great at keeping up with what you've done. And then all of a sudden your body starts producing these maladaptive dysfunctions, you know, like what you're talking about and then the fatigue and the tiredness or what have you, that plays a big part for sure. Okay. So backing out Mm -hmm. from this, uh, you know, (laughs) you're, um, you know, a couple that's that's going forward and they're they're in their forties mm-hmm. and they're starting to look mm-hmm. around. I will say this: just three days ago, maybe two days ago, mm-hmm. uh, someone in my close friend circle had a heart attack. He's fifty-one mm-hmm. years old. Oh, so wow. if you're in your forties and you're looking ahead, there are significant life events coming up that are you know life and death grade uh, when mm-hmm. you turn fifty. You enter a zone in your life where. Mm -hmm. Some of you are not going to get out for natural reasons. Some of you are just going to wear your body out faster than others. So a couple in their 40s that want to do this, from your experience, do they do this together as a couple? Or is this something where the wife says, I have to do this right now? You know, you have to do what you do, but I'm going to go this route. I will say thus far, um, usually I've been within a network of women or someone who sought out. And the truth is women are the top consumers too. They're going to seek something for their health before a male. I mean, statistics shows that Um, in general. I think that there is definitely couples that do so. And one, what I find often, there's usually one a lot more motivated and than the other. Mm-hmm. And then that second one, whoever it was, the male or the female, may end up getting drawn in seeing the other results or seeing what the other person is doing. It's just like with smoking. I always ask if somebody's trying to quit smoking, who smokes in your house? Yeah. Because if you're really trying to uh, stop smoking, it's, it's really difficult to stop smoking around people who are always smoking. Right. So the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And then when, when we are looking at these changes and trying to do it, how hard is this? I mean, are people successful at that? I mean, obviously they're going to spend a lot of money to get in front of a doctor mm-hmm. to work on these things, mm-hmm. but, and if they do it, I'm assuming the programs work, but how hard is it to get someone from, I want to start to three months later, next check in the annual check in you're like, Hey, this has really made a difference. I would say the ideal person is someone who is very motivated and they've reached that point. They Mm -hmm. have or gone through other programs. They've gone to other physicians, nutritionists, or whoever that specialist or clinician that they sought expertise from. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at things from a different lens, a different eye. And it makes sense, you know. Uh, A lot of people, it may be more difficult to buy in, literally, because there's 
um, there's a certain doctrine of managed care out there and it's okay. Why doesn't my regular doctor, you know, offer these type of things. But I mean, that's like with any major shift in medicine, it always takes a few decades, you know, or something to really catch up uh, to the science. So I really, I truly believe it's garnered to that very motivated person. Mm -hmm. Um, they're actually already seeking it out because it's not something that you see on, you know, commercials outside of pharmaceutical things. Um, they're really looking for that edge, that opportunity to look outside the box of what they are used to doing. And will I say that's the majority now? No, but do I think definitely there's a large population growing in that community? Yes. Buying in also means finding that doctor. So, so let's say mm-hmm. you are in a PPO or an HMO mm-hmm. or you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. How does one pursue this? I mean, let's say Kaiser is mm-hmm. just not going to cut you a prescription to go see, you know, mm-hmm. you. So mm-hmm. how, how yeah. does one navigate that to even see if this is worth their time? I would say that any of the things that I offer through an epigenetics program or a precision medicine program is not alongside with my managed care model. Uh, I am an OBGYN um, by trade. I still love what I do. I, I really feel like I'm in my purpose and my destiny. Uh, however, I, um, like any other doctor, or I feel most doctors, we evolve. We catch up with uh, science, medical technology that's out there. And if we really want to be more cutting edge and more in view, of what the future looks like, we do have to tap in things like this. So I find that it's going to be difficult to just find someone because this is not a regular referral system. Like Mm -hmm. if you go to your primary care doctor, this is not, oh, okay, well, let me refer you, at least in my region or in a lot of regions, this is um, a a culture that may be more persistent in one and others, like what do you call it? Acupuncture Mm -hmm. or more holistic medicine is definitely more prominent in other regions versus others. So um, this is not like a comment, okay, here is a referral to an epigenetics or precision medicine doctor. These are things that actively a patient or a client is seeking out on their own. You said precision medicine, and I want to make sure mm-hmm. we slow down here and kind of mm-hmm. differentiate and describe what precision medicine mm-hmm. is versus mm-hmm. like an epigenetic approach. Precision medicine is an individualized approach of medical care. And it looks in different formats, depending on the physician or depending on the clinician that's involved with it. Epigenetics is actually a way that you can be or utilize precision medicine, where you're at, it's a tool where you're understanding how are the genes turned on and off in your system, and you're getting more of that targeted approach. So um, there are other parts of it that that we use. Precision medicine can use wearable technology to be more finite and more descriptive of uh, a patient's plan of care. Mm. Um, You can do laboratory studies um, that are more specific. You know, these are all things that are drawn in, but this makes it more precise because you're using all of these tools because they use more precision and an individualized approach. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of okay. sense. Mm-hmm. And, okay. and it doesn't sound like, like I go to the VA, mm-hmm. God bless those guys. They have mm-hmm. so much to mm-hmm. do, but I see my doctor mm-hmm. once a year. I have mm-hmm. to call in and they'll refer me to anywhere, but my management of my care is completely on me. And if I don't stand mm-hmm. up for myself, then then mm-hmm. I get what was offered, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's also a teaching hospital. And again, mm-hmm. wonderful, yeah. love that opportunity, mm-hmm. but it's very challenging to know the right and wrong thing. And now we're talking about a level above that. Here's the thing that surprises the (laughs) heck out of me. (laughs) I'm still (laughs) alive and I'm 50 years old. I thought for sure I'd be (laughs) dead by now, you know? And then in my parents' time, people often died in their 50s and certainly in their Mm -hmm. 60s. But now it Mm -hmm. appears as though I may live another 30, maybe even 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I look at my body and my, you know, my joints, I got to take care of this thing. So Mm -hmm. Kind of illustrate the the different philosophy. It's not holistic that you got what you guys do. It's not, hey, this is broken, fix it medicine. How would you describe how you guys practice medicine and your your mental approach? Well, first off, it's interesting that you men- mentioned holistic because one of the things that I always, when, uh, when I'm speaking to female groups, is I love to use the word holistic, but W H O L E. Uh huh. Because oftentimes, It's all about understanding that we are the sum of all of our parts. I think 
a lot of times we set up this paradigm in, in medicine where we have to segment things, mm-hmm. you know, and it's kind of built like that. You know, a doctor goes to a family practitioner, they learn um, or medical school and they get trained in family medicine. And then you have your ortho, orthopedic doctor, urologist, ob whatever. So, I mean, you have your own specialties, of course. And a lot of times there's not, there may be a lack of collaboration or underlying vein of what's going on. And especially if it's um, someone has suffered trauma, neglect, or any of those particular things. But this allows us to take that information in somebody's background and also see the contributions that are there through their environment. So that could be from an extent of toxins, that could be an extent of sleep, the extent of stress, all of these things that, you know, Pete, you, you mentioned yourself, you know, like, wow, I'm 50 and I can, you know, I could believe that I'll be uh, still alive at this age is because you probably just like many of us, we've gone through many things in our life that you feel like, oh my God, you know, I wish I had nine lives, you know, it, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah. it takes you down and it takes its toll and it helps you better understand what particularly the be used for someone in an individualized approach to meet some of their goals. Mm. So what I find is these are women who want to increase productivity, like they've reached a certain point, they reach a certain plateau, or they just are trying to get there. But the old modalities just aren't working for them. They're still seeing that decline. They still don't, they still are kind of pushing through, but not getting the true results that they want. Okay, so so someone mm-hmm. is interested. They're like, wow, oh, epigenetics. Pete's talked mm-hmm. about this before. Mm-hmm. Peptides, all of these forward-leaning mm-hmm. things. What else is out there that we're not talking about right now? Um, th- there mm-hmm. seems like there are so many different mm-hmm. approaches. And I don't want to mm-hmm. get into wearables because mm-hmm. that's also a big mm-hmm. part of this. But mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. what have I missed? I'll kind of stay in my lane a little bit because this is something I'm excited about. Mm-hmm. It's preconception health. To me, I think that with the age of women. Um, getting pregnant a lot later in life, um, waiting to start their families when um, they're well into their 30s, when it used to be more um, Mm 20-something. And knowing that this is a growing population, uh, infertility rates have increased, people seeking reproductive health care in order to get pregnant um, has increased over time because of some of the age-related things or outside factors. But preconception health gives you an opportunity to really optimize your health, optimize hormones to improve not only implantation, but improve pregnancy, improve um, the state of your pregnancy and thereon. Uh, the reason why this interests me a lot, Pete, is the fact that, you know, we're in the United States and we literally have the worst in- industrialized outcomes for our moms. Mm. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, help okay, me understand. Yeah. So, but why? I mean, we're, we're, you know, technically we should have definitely all the cutting edge things. There's uh, lots of access of care, even though there's several areas and this is not, you know, that type of medium to talk about that where you know, living in America today, there is a lack and there it does exist. But have we ever thought about what does that look like if we took out the part of just, oh, I got pregnant. Well, oh, I'm planning to get pregnant. And what Mm. I'm doing as I plan to get pregnant, I'm not just having sex, but I'm really trying to make sure that my health is where I want it to be before I, I try to get pregnant. And what does that future look like? Does that technically improve outcomes later? I don't know necessarily the statistics that back that up, but literally part of any prenatal care or a woman going through pregnancy, we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about exercise, we're talking about these things, but this is someone that can literally hadn't eaten right (laughs) or exercise in the last three years, you know, and, but they've created a baby in that environment. I'm not saying these are bad genes. I'm just saying, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. When we actually put in that effort of moving some of those those ideas, that future innovation of preconception health, that would that change these outcomes? Uh, you know, this these are the possibilities that I, that really interest me and that excite me. You know, literally talking about it because you know it makes you wonder. You know, it makes you think. Yeah, this is interesting. So, so we really can. I mean, as we look at the body as a machine and mm-hmm. all the different parts mm-hmm. and what you want to feed it, you can have a less problematic pregnancy. Of course, that mm-hmm. makes sense when you think about it. Mm-hmm. And you can lay the ground to make you know your fitness level and everything mm-hmm. and, and give the baby the best possible mm-hmm. nutrients, but have that mm-hmm. ground laid before you even have a baby mm-hmm. in there. Yeah, because yeah. it has generational effects, like transgenerational effects. 
Uh Like things my mother did affected me and things her mom did affected her. So therefore, I mean, these are genetic pools that are spread. So just imagine what that lens looks like when we actually are intentional about what we're doing before getting pregnant. And then it can have like literally transgenerational effects. So let me see if I get what you're saying. Because Mm -hmm. of the habits of the mom, you can Mm -hmm. trigger certain genetic sequencing that is, uh, I don't know, you know, you now have asthma or whatever. You're more apt to Mm -hmm. get asthma. And then again, because you always family screen, does anybody in your family have Mm -hmm. asthma? Yes, my mom had asthma. Mm -hmm. That's why I have it. And then now that gene is there to be triggered Mm -hmm. each time you have a kid down the Mm -hmm. line. Is that what you're saying? No, no, okay, I'm, not, I'm not. Okay. No, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad I asked. Uh, yes, yes. That was, that was a good question. So there's certain determinants of what gene is expressed or not. And there's certain abnormality or disease processes that are known to be passed down. Um, like sickle cell, you know, we know what's another Huntington's disease, um, polycystic kidney disease, because these are actual disease processes that have a determinate dysfunction in the actual gene itself as it's passed on. Mm -hmm. What I'm speaking about has to do with some of the nutritional or lifestyle changes that we're able to change how certain genes are on and off that have to do with long-term effects meaning that it could potentially reduce, excuse me, improve your metabolism. It can potentially definitely increase the propensity or the probability of understanding your sleep patterns, how you address stress. So you can make those accommodations in your lifestyle. And that has great effects because a lot of us want to be able to produce and perform at a certain level and to understand that, okay, well, I have uh, how my genetic expression I don't metabolize caffeine as much Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. don't do it as fast. So that's probably why I'm constantly fatigued and I'm always grabbing a cup of joe, you know, those type of things. So the lifestyle input and then also how that affects any particular disease process could be how you recover, how um, certain medications um, that you are prescribed, you know, there's so many other things that you can extrapolate from it, but there's some determinate genes that are passed on based on familiar or defective expressions. Yes. But asthma. Asthma, no. Okay, fair enough. Your kids, fair enough. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that all your kids are going to have asthma. <laughs> <laughs> Bad example. Um, mm-hmm. The environment obviously is a big thing. We learned again mm-hmm. from Wade Lightheart that uh, at least for male, testosterone levels are 40% mm-hmm. of what they used to be at a given age. And it just, mm-hmm. uh, he was like, a lot of this stuff is external environment. We consume more plastic now. Our, our fish mm-hmm. has plastic in it. There's all mm-hmm. these things that contaminate, but you're saying the environment is something even more than that. Like how mm-hmm. we sleep, what disturbs that, all of these things. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a mm-hmm. bit about that? I mentioned, you mentioned sleep. I'm a big one to talk about stress and not only stress itself, but how do we handle stress? Um, What is our psychological propensity is when we get into stressful environments. So I'm in the medical community and you can always probably see on any standard uh, medical floor, there's going to be some amount of sugar. You know, there's going to be some amount of things that we reach or have a tendency to reach because it has a short term gain, but it's worth it at that mm-hmm. point because these are high level environments. So I think of stress, I think of sleep, and then I think of trauma. Trauma is really big, especially for women, because it could have been something that psychologically has impaired or started particular fears or things that, you know, that are recurrent lifestyle things that they tend to get into the same hole of the same results, but it takes a different picture because of one particular event. And pediatrics causes the ACEs where these are particular events that has happened in a child's life, but understanding that, okay, this has a propensity to change the trajectory of a life depending Mm. on how that trauma was addressed. You know, meaning did that child get therapy? Did that child get in a home where they were loved as opposed to staying in a home where they had too many traumatic experiences or what have you? We're learning all of that behavior wise, psychological wise really does input into certain things that are expressed. One of the things I always like to tell people is um, 
a common symptom I see is chronic pelvic pain for women. They're actually organic problems that can cause pelvic pain. But one of the things we've always been taught is always ask about sexual assault history because there's certain things psychologically where there can be no disease processes, but women can hold certain amount of pain in their pelvic organs because of a traumatic event. No kidding. Wow. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about the things Mm -hmm. we ingest then, you know, through Mm -hmm. our packaging and everything else as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, there is a lot that has to do with the plastics for women is it could be your cosmetics. It could be the dyes and your hair. It could be the pesticides. A lot of us, you know, play sports on, on areas or in our backyards that we treat a certain way. All of those things have a potential of changing um, how our body functions. And these are disruptors. They're literally disruptors. And food is a big one. You know, just there, there's so much that (laughs) is placed in food these days, the additives. Even myself, I have migraines and I know triggers. I know my triggers. And it oftentimes is something that is nutrition or something I've been exposed to in the nutrition. Uh, The additives, uh, things to preserve, Uh, All of these are things that particularly that we ingest Mm -hmm. without even knowing, you know, that technically can disrupt some of the bodily functions in our body or for some people have more propensity to cause more inflammation in our body. And we all know inflammation is bad. We don't like that. Bad. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And we all know inflammation is bad. We don't like that. Bad. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the ways to kind of assess the external environment is through wearables, you know, a variety mm-hmm. of watches and whatnot. I know Dr. Gappin talks about the Phoenix 7 and there's a mm-hmm. new Suntoll mm-hmm. watch coming out and mm-hmm. they're all tracking more and more like how our mm-hmm. body, you know, like, mm-hmm. okay, measuring mm-hmm. speed and time is one thing, but these things really are measuring us at a lot better level. Mm-hmm. What are mm-hmm. your thoughts on that? And, and, and what is, what does someone do? Who, you don't have to have a thousand dollar watch to do this either. No. Way. No, 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 you don't, but it's useful. Mm-hmm. It's it's very useful. I think we're in a day and age where we need to understand and embrace technology if we're trying to meet some of the health outcomes. I, I mean, when you come in for chest pain, you're using some technology of <laughs> assessing whether you have a heart attack. Mm. It's the same thing from day to day. Why not have, I mean, as much as we check possibly our email or our social media, why not do a check-in of what's going on in your house? So one of my newest finds and things that I work on with my patients, and I'm going to show you it because actually I was operating and I put it around my <laughs> my scrubs, it's uh, the aura ring. And I, I find that I depend on this thing more than I thought I would, but it's a ring, huh. a tracker that helps me look at my sleep patterns. Um, it tracks... Uh, an extent of activity. It helps me understand my readiness is what we call it for the day where it's factored in your sleep because studies have shown that literally some form or excessive sleep deprivation takes about two days to really for your body to recover. Two to three days for some, some people. And this helps evaluate like your resting heart rate, your heart rate variability. Uh, I mean, all of these things are, in my opinion, going to be common language and common conversation mm-hmm. one day where somebody's going to not only know their steps, but they're going to know their sleep pattern or their readiness level. And it really helps you gear toward making those changes because you're you're more cognizant of it. It's like you're more aware. It's like it, you have your own accountability partner, like mm-hmm. on your wrist or on your <laughs> on my finger. So I think it's something we need to embrace, and I think it's something that is really truly amazing. And it's starting to. I mean, AI is here, and yeah, it's not going anywhere. Well, and there's also a mm-hmm. uh, a form of uh, social science um, called mm-hmm. basically cyborg studies. You know, mm-hmm, and understanding mm-hmm. our cyborg selves because we do have aura mm-hmm. rings and we do have wearable watches. We do have mm-hmm. a phone that keeps track of our. Ca- mm-hmm. We really are cyborgs. A lot of it's external for now, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it, that part of the market has changed. Um, mm-hmm. When when you look at the investment to care for yourself, mm-hmm. just thinking about the mm-hmm. accountability partner that your watch can be mm-hmm. or whatever, 
mm-hmm. simply getting up and going to bed. Mm-hmm. I know so many of my <laughs> friends are like, I, I end up watching extra TV. And then mm-hmm. you take 90 minutes of your sleep time and, and mm-hmm. you lose it. It's gone. You're not yeah. going to get it back. Mm-hmm. You know, that accountability mm-hmm. partner is big because a lot of times I'll feel when I'm, I'm great at going to sleep and I'm great at staying mm-hmm. asleep, but I can feel like <laughs> if I'm getting outside of my window and then I try to go to bed right then and just relax and fall asleep. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. It, it does take practice. It does take some accountability, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. It does. And, but it's like, I recommend, especially if we're talking about sleep, that's one of the biggest things I talk about in my and platform talks mm-hmm. and as well as working with female clients, because it's really important and it's the least inexpensive thing. You were talking about the investment and literally sleep is the least <laughs> inexpensive <laughs> thing that you could do. Right. And let's do it. And that means not going to sleep with your phones, um, the blue light. Um, it definitely causes melatonin disruptions and you want to make sure you're getting your sleep. So uh, I think the investment is worth it. Um, but I think people need to also understand what is going to be best with them as their accountability. Mm-hmm. Um, like for me, I didn't want to use the Garmin because it was like too much. You know, I, I want to concentrate or focus on a few things. And you can with the Garmin. It's a great tool. But uh, I wanted to focus on a, a few things other than just following steps or activity and calorie levels with workouts on my watch or something. So, but I, I feel that when you try to do too much, then you kind of get lost. Mm-hmm. You, you feel overwhelmed. I, I suggest always stay with things you're comfortable with and use that and build on that. And then, you know, go to the more high tech and more expensive things. What does it cost to do this? Like, I mean, this kind of health mm-hmm. is proactive. So um, mm-hmm. if there was a subscription model, what does something like this mm-hmm. cost per month? Is it because you have to work out, you have to eat right mm-hmm. and all those things, but is it like a $500 a month investment in yourself so that you have a body that's still useful in 30 years? Are you speaking from like to hire someone like Well, me I'm just saying in general, what, what's your sense? I, I'm like, because mm-hmm. hiring you is part of it. But there's mm-hmm. testing and then there's wearables, there's testing. but it is an investment. Like if you're going to invest mm-hmm. for your retirement, okay, that's your mm-hmm. money. Now yeah. you have to invest in your you as well, because mm-hmm. I learned this from, uh, there's a from, price thing. yeah, from mm-hmm. the ladies at Prelis, uh, biologic, they are working on printing organs and they're you know going to start with kidneys, but they were saying mm-hmm. that like almost everybody has an organ that is in some form of failure. You know, they're not, it's not mm-hmm. operating at a hundred percent. And so mm-hmm. if they can crack okay. the code on swapping out organs, organ transplants are going to become a lot more prevalent because it'll be your own, your own organ created outside of your body. Uh, mm-hmm. Rather than do that <laughs> and spend, mm-hmm. I don't know, a quarter million dollars to swap out your kidney over 10 years. It seems to me it makes sense to also try to be proactive and spend, I don't know, $500 a month, whatever that number is. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to get Mm -hmm. a handle on. But when you you sort everything together, is this Mm -hmm. affordable for someone who's middle class? Yes, I think it is. Because I think there's different models that can fit what suits that person the best. And I find literally people are going to invest in what they feel that they want their money to go to. Mm -hmm. You, especially, I mean, if you're using the example of the middle class, you still have middle class women or men who may choose, um, you know, your run of the mill car Mm -hmm. Uh, and those who want to be in the most sporty car and, Hey, this is what I want to drive. This is what pleases me. This is what I want to put my money in. Yeah. And therefore, if that's the case, then, you know, you're probably not going to want to spend a lot of money in certain programs or you may. Uh, it's kind of meeting people where they are and uh, understanding the possibilities and the potential to get to where they want to be. And uh, some people are ready for that investment and not. But I think it's definitely something for all people. But it is an investment. It's not like you're buying a, a, you know, a mortgage or a home. But what kind of price can you really put on your health? I was, I just put in one of my YouTube channels. It was a, a question. Me and my girlfriends would get together. And I mean, a simple question. You had a genie, grant you three wishes. What do you want? Everybody across yeah. the board, health, yeah. you know? So if that's the case, then, okay, exactly. How do you want to invest in that? You know, what, what does that look like for you? Because if it's really, truly something that, you know, a genie in the bottle you want to grant you, then, okay, well, let's get serious about it. what kind of investment you want in order to get the results that you want. Right, 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 right. What about for kids? Is it too young? Mm-hmm. Is, is five years old, 10 years old? How does that work? Well, that's interesting because I'm, I'm exploring that. And I know a lot of um, some of the people in our tribe of precision medicine and epigenetics have geared to pediatrics. Uh, and my focus a bit has been more women. 
But I think there's definitely something there. And I think it's something that parents can explore, especially if they're noticing certain health issues with their child at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. They're already thinking outside of the box. They don't want just a prescription. They want to know some things that can be more geared down to what their child needs and wants. And hey, um, I definitely think that avenue is there for sure. And what about the parent that wants to uh, make a super kid? Super baby. Yeah. Super kid. <laughs> if it's possible to do and mm-hmm. there's money on the line, you know, and victory mm-hmm. on the line, people mm-hmm. are going to do it. When you first, literally, when you first ask, ask that question and I'm thinking about it, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, technically people are already doing that in a way, you mm-hmm. know, it's just making a super baby is relative, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say that, Pete, is, I mean, currently right now, there are people who are going through some type of fertility treatment and selecting a boy and a girl. Yeah. Or a boy or a girl. Right. You know, or knowing that they're going to have, you know, twins purposely. Yes. Or you doing genetic testing to see whether your baby may have any of the particular malformations or disease processes that could pass along and cause any prematurity or cognitive delays and all that and making choices based on that. So to me, it's kind of already there. Mm. Uh, And it's already to some extent uh, being practiced in one form of another, you know, because of how our our choices have have been when it comes to that. But seriously, when we talk about doing it through precision medicine, I mean, who benefits the most? It's really the person who's trying to get pregnant. right? Right. And then you're implying some of those benefits to carry on to your generation. So it's the hope of, I guess, a super baby, but you're allowing the cars to fall what may based on healthier choices that you're making. A lot of times in science, as we go, we learn from mistakes and we, we tune mm-hmm. what was there. You know, we've done this with a lot of mm-hmm. things. Are we mm-hmm. going to wake up and find out, I don't know, 30 years from now that epigenetics mm-hmm. is like, oh gosh, you know what? Not enough, too much. Are we, are we going to always constantly tune this thing? Is it dangerous? Are we worried about the long-term effects? Are, are there longitudinal studies backing this stuff? There definitely a lot of studies that are coming out and are still in progress of this particular type of medicine, and it's still there. But do I feel like it's something that can be embraced for years to come? Yes, okay. I, I definitely do. Will it be in the same format? Who knows? Because there have been changes and transitions in medicine throughout our lifetime. Right. You know, yeah. at, you know, at one point in time, it was understanding the anatomy, uh, body, testing out antibiotics. I mean, there are tons of drug therapies out now where I remember certain drugs that I, for sure we prescribed in medical school and they're like black box now, you know? So I think at some point there's always a transition, but it goes back to my statement about evolution or evolving our mind. If it's not epigenetics, then what is the bill that epigenetics has allowed for the next generation? You Mm -hmm. know, what is that platform or the footstool that epigenetics has started for another revolution of of healthcare? And I'm all about that because the world's going to be different. 30 years from now. Yeah. And you can't be doing the same thing, expecting, you know, different results uh, is one of my favorite quotes. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. When you have clients come in the door, they must have a common theme or thread. What are these women Mm -hmm. saying to you? And you're like, this is an epigenetics type solution. This is precision Mm -hmm. medicine based. What what are those environments? Because I, I want to paint this for people who are listening going, mm-hmm. well, I'm not really worried about any of that stuff. I don't care about performance. Mm-hmm. I just care about X. Mm-hmm. And it turns out X is mm-hmm. your number one factor. Weight management is a big one. Mm-hmm. Fatigue is another big one. I see many women in general or people who speak to me about trouble getting pregnant. I get that a lot. Irregular menses those type of things. And what I want to clue in is, is there something that is important in your lifestyle, things that you do on an everyday basis where we can really dial into what's going to help you out the most? And not everybody necessarily wants it. I I run into women all the time and this is natural. I mean, this is me, you know, I'm being real. This is me. If I have a headache, I'm going to pop ibuprofen, you know, right then, because I, I need to do something and ibuprofen works for me. Mm-hmm. And there are many women, they're just like, hey, I just need this because I want a, something quick. And unfortunately, that's our society where it might be a more propensity to this microwave type yeah. 
result. So I definitely always say it's it's a type of female or patient who is very much in tune to, hey, I don't want to do this. I want to spend the time. I want to make sure that I uh, I lose the weight right. I still love food, but I want to know what foods work for me. I still want to gain a lot more energy throughout the day, but I don't want to pop a pill to get there. You know, is these are certain things that are important in the conversation because not everybody is there. And I like to meet women where they are. And if I'm not trying to push epigenetics or precision medicine down anybody's throat, because it's important for me to share the knowledge of the world and how medicine is evolving. Right. And with that comes people who are not ready to meet it there. And if that's the case, okay, so what else can we do? Mm -hmm. Because there's still some other tools in the toolbox that we can address it. And it might be a little bit of pouring into the genetic or the epigenetics field, or maybe a lot. So it kind of depends. One of the things when I, when I hear about these things and testosterone and all this stuff that, you know, that are, that are pitched at me constantly, like I understand the <laughs> external environment is impacting my life. And, and you describe mm-hmm. some of the things like weight gain and tired. Mm-hmm. That also sounds like being middle-aged. You know? <laughs> so so uh, um, I often, I feel like I'm cheating if I take testosterone, even if I need it. I'm like, no, I took uh-huh. pill and that sort of uh-huh. help me understand and the audience, especially like. I mean, I'm not looking to be a baseball player. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to get huge. I'm just mm-hmm. trying to be the best Pete I can be mm-hmm. within the normal band of what is Pete. I don't want to be super mm-hmm. Pete, just mm-hmm. healthy Pete. Staying in the lane of my females. So can I switch it a little bit? For yes, those absolutely. Who want hormone optimization because I do a lot of that. And however, when women look, like if they Google hormone optimization and they'll see a lot about hormone replacement. And I get a lot of questions about, okay, are my hormones out of balance? And do I need hormones? Do I need to take hormones? Honestly, my question and my answer to that question is no. Mm -hmm. But however, what are your outcomes? What are you trying to reach? Um, Because that's important. I've learned that I had to use an individualized approach. Even if it's not epigenetics, I try not to necessarily put every woman in a certain cup or try to contain them based on, oh, okay, well, everybody's getting bioidentical hormone replacement. And this is exactly what's going to be right for you. Right. Um, because there's a different benefit risk profile. And you're right. I mean, taking testosterone or a man who chooses to take testosterone is not, I mean, majority of them are not like your athletic men, but they love the drive and the endurance and the energy it gives them. And it makes a difference. And what, what does that do? It helps them be um, a happier person. Uh, it could help them be a better father, a better husband, be able to perform at the level that they want to. But all of those things need to be evaluated under a benefits risk profile because it may not meet for everyone. So the same thing as I feel about hormone replacement is something I, I can use. I think it's something that definitely benefits a lot of women. I have people that will tell you like, oh my God, I feel like I'm a night and day person and my husband thanks you. But at the same time, it may not be for everyone, you know? Yeah, right. It may not be for everyone. And then there are a lot of solutions, again, pitched at mm-hmm. me, and uh-huh. a lot of them are available at GNC. And yeah. <laughs> I look at that store and I think, who's wow. in charge there? Like, what's mm-hmm. in these pills? Um, mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't know. And I know a lot of mm-hmm. us just pop them and take them. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that's a bad approach, but I can't mm-hmm. wrap my head around why you would take whatever supplement somebody recommended When I have access to you as a doctor Uh and say, hey, should I be taking whatever Mm -hmm. it is? But I think you kind of alluded to it, but in a different way. You Mm. said, and I have access to you like a doctor. Yeah. However, I don't think people feel that way sometimes. They have greater access with the, hey, I think I was feeling this. And, oh, I have a friend who's taking this. Yes. Oh, really? (laughs) That works? Oh, okay. I'm going to go pick that up. Uh It's as simple as that. Literally, you know, yeah. oh, I'm going to go to try that out because that that worked for you. Hey, it's that's accessible to them. To me, I might not be as accessible to them. Right. Um, even though I may feel that way. But, you know, the busy female mm-hmm. is, hey, she's talking to her girlfriend. She's talking to her family. She's taught, you know, she's Googling things on a regular basis. And it may be 
easier for her to walk in her GNC because it's right by, hey, her home, she's driving mm-hmm. by and hey, I feel a little fatigued. Oh, they had, oh, I heard, I heard something on Dr. Oz or mm-hmm. Oprah, you know, it could have been any of those. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go try that, you know? So I think of things simple like that. It's not the intention of feeling that they can't come to a doctor, have that accessibility. And, and Patients and clients have been burned by physicians before. I'm not going to say that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think with the World Wide Web and so much information and content out there where you can just walk in your GNC and grab what they talked about on a podcast or they picked up on the radio. That's accessible to people. That's that's consumers. That's true consumers. Yeah, interesting. It's like the people that like I practiced on my face and I made face cream and look how wonderful wonderful my face is. Like I'm sort uh-huh. of terrified of that. You, who are you? <laughs> what what is your degree in? Do you have a degree? Yes. You know, mm-hmm. you made this in your kitchen, and and certain mm-hmm. things you can do in your house in your garage, like start a computer company. But mm-hmm. um, making supplements, gosh, it just gets a little terrifying, you know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I'm not saying there are not any reputable things out there because yeah, of course. Uh, I I peruse. I actually go peruse stuff because mm-hmm. I'll have patients bring stuff to me all the time, and so that was really important to me when I went through um, some of my integrative training is to understand because this wasn't taught in conventional med- in conventional medical school. Some of the some it's like you knew the supplements, but you know they were very basic. Now I need to understand, you know, some of these bigger names and what they're used for. And so I took that extra time because people were bringing and they'll have like Ziploc bags full of supplements and and things that they're taking and really trying to understand, Okay, why are you taking this? What do you what are you doing? Okay, well, you don't need this. And actually know that I have the foundation of knowledge. of This is why I suggest you don't do it. And so that's been a benefit. But I walk in, I literally peruse aisles. I peruse products sometimes just to understand what my patients and my clients are, are taking. As we all try to improve, I always try to find like mm-hmm. one simple thing we can do. Like, how? okay, mm-hmm. yeah, great. You need to be in shape. But how do we get the person mm-hmm. up off the couch? Like, what's mm-hmm. something that everybody can do that doesn't require any extra significant cost? You know, is there is there mm-hmm. a food we can eat more of? Is there some mm-hmm. habit we can develop? What's one thing mm-hmm. you would recommend? Sleep. Ah, I love it. Okay. You talked me into it. More naps. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> yeah. And try to optimize a nap between one and four, if that's your normal circadian rhythm or what have you. I really do. I think there's um, a cheat. Sleep is underrated oftentimes because we've, we've driven ourselves so far sometimes with the lack of. But um, I think if I had to ask somebody to do one thing, and it's the least, ex- in, uh, excuse me, it's the most inexpensive. It's the one thing that you don't have to walk out of a door to go get you can yeah. do it right there on your couch. Yeah. Literally. Right. Literally. It's sleep. It's and it's cheap. Sleep. It's really, really and cheap. It's, cheap. it's really cheap. And naps are wonderful. Naps, naps are uh-huh. my chocolate. I don't need chocolate, <laughs> but I do need naps. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that improves a lot of cognitive it, function. You it's, know, honestly, like I have PTSD all. and... I often mm-hmm. go meditate and I don't mind at all if I fall into mm-hmm. a nap because it's a form of meditation for me. And I, yes. I yes. get through the second half of my day better. I take a nap basically mm-hmm. every day, you know? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. well, listen, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate it. This was awesome. You gave us so many things okay. to think about and, and work on. Okay. And I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on. Mm-hmm. I hope you'll come back so we can talk more about this stuff. Yes. Yes. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this has been a good time, a good conversation. Uh, we'll meet up again, I guess, with Dr. Gappin as well. But yeah, I want to get a shout out to Dr. Larissa and her tribe and all those women out there, those future female women. And so tune in to Future Female Fridays at Dr. Larissa. Um, YouTube and drlarissa.com uh, subscribe. I am looking forward to our future female movement and how we are taking our health care in our own hands and being accountable for it. So I love it. Love it. Thank you so much, people.